And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Elizabeth Weeks Leonard and Jay Altenhaus, professor here at University of Georgia, uh, graduate of the law school, one of our most esteemed alumni. Um, started uh, teaching in the University of Kansas, and they were fortunate enough that she came back home to Georgia, uh, and she's a nationally recognized expert on healthcare uh, law, healthcare financing issues, and uh, she will introduce this panel for you. Thank you, Fuzzle, and Bill, and Mason, and everyone for attending. This is a really exciting event. And our second annual um, Rural Healthcare Symposium, the attendance has grown, and the interest and the issues continue to grow. And we're here to focus today on the state of rural healthcare legislation and public policy. And I'm joined today by Brock Slabeck, um, who joined us from um, the National Rural Health Association, Ethan James, who is um, with the Georgia Hospital Association, Dr. William Custer at um, and the Georgia. Well, actually, you told me the affiliation listed on the program is incorrect. So there you go. Um, and Preston Smith um, with Tyler and Company. And I will um, um, make our introduction short to save time for discussion. Each of our panelists are going to begin with a few comments about issues of particular focus in their work, and then we'll um, open it up for a broader Q and A. So. Uh, Thank you very much. Like uh, King Henry told each of his eight wives, I'm going to keep you for a very short time here this afternoon. Um, I, that joke usually takes a while for it to uh, roll, a, roll along, but um, I'm always thrilled when uh, people are in, excited and, and interested in rural health. I spent my career in uh, rural health. I grew up in rural Kansas. I was a hospital administrator in rural Mississippi for 20 years, which uh, I understand a lot of the problems that Georgia faces as well in terms of the economy, the, the uh, geography, and the diverse populations that are being served. Um, just a couple of things. I need to see the um, screen. So uh, our membership, I want to thank everyone in Georgia that are members of the National Rural Health Association. We have quite a few here in the state, and we're very thankful for that. Um, there's three things that are really dealing with rural America when we talk about uh, health care. The first is the economy, and uh, you guys on the previous panel did a great job talking about how uh, rural uh, econ economic conditions are very impoverished generally, and uh, since the Great Recession of 2009, the recovery has been uh, certainly a lot less in uh, non-metro counties of the United States than in metro. And so this is contributing to a real problem that then leads into mortality rates. And we had a great discussion earlier from CDC on the um, problems that we see with our geography-based uh, analysis of, pop, uh, of uh, mortality. And we see that these gaps between rural and urban are, are growing. And then this has contributed also, this is also exacerbated by the opioid crisis that was talked about this morning. And then the third issue that we're dealing with is rural hospital closures all over the United States. Um, you can see the graphic that University of North Carolina did uh, charting the uh, closures since 2005 through today. And you can see the rapid increase that's happened over the period of time since this was started. And then you can see geographically where those are mostly occurring. And I think that it's safe to say that uh, we're, we're in a process now of trying to analyze uh, how this is going to impact uh, rural communities going forward, given what I just said. So this is, and you probably talked about this this morning before I was able to get here, but Georgia has uh, basically seven rural closures from 2005 to the present time, according to the University of North Carolina. Uh, two were PPS hospitals or um, uh, prospective payment system hospitals, and five were critical access hospitals for a total of seven. Uh, nationally, you can see we're at 120 for the total period of time during that uh, frame of reference. So where are the closures nationally? I borrowed the University of North Carolina slide to show you two things. One, the distribution of where they were through 2014. And then more importantly, the states that are coded in uh, beige are states that expanded Medicaid. And the University of North Carolina, my friends there, George Pink and his team, have uh, been able to issue a correlation between rural hospital closure and lack of Medicaid expansion. They are nearly able to get to a causative uh, relationship to, uh, to that issue. So, so this is something that I think, according to the data, is suggesting that Medicaid expansion is having a positive um, uh, uh, impact on the hospitals that are in states that uh, did expand their Medicaid programs. 
And then getting close to the end here, uh, there's a catastrophic crisis that not just have hospitals closed, but we took the general pro forma of, cr of critical operations and we've uh, distributed those um, uh, characteristics of the 70 plus hospitals that closed and we extrapolated that over the some 1800 rural hospitals that are still open and we discovered that about 210 are at high risk for closure now across the United States. So these are facilities that are on the that are matching almost identically the characteristics of the closures that have happened over the last several years. Secondly, we've identified 463, 463 that are at risk. Now they're not at that precipice of closing, but they are definitely considered to be uh, close. And so this is something uh, that we're watching at the current trajectory. 25% of rural hospitals will close within a decade um, if current trends aren't uh, particularly reversed. And the HA chart book and MedPAC all agree that we do have a problem with rural health and its reimbursements. And one of the things I'm going to mention about hospital closures is it, you, you can ask from a you can talk about from a policy point of view as to whether that's a big deal or not. And I've had questions from congressmen about that very issue. Uh, what I point out, and I think it's important for everybody here in the room to understand, because of the economics over the last 10 years, most hospitals now employ their entire primary care workforce in their communities. So if the hospital closes, you've essentially ended the employment for every primary care provider in that particular area. Now, I can tell you one thing, having served in a rural community, once that resource is gone, they're not coming back. So I think the investment that we make in terms of what we do for this problem going forward is, is huge. And I'm going to leave this slide deck with you. This is March of 2017 data from the University of North Carolina Shep Center on rural Georgia performance in terms of hospitals. And so I took some of the key operating statistics from total margin, cash flow, return on equity, operating margin, current ratio, days cash on hand, and days net AR. You can see that the total operating margin, according to the Shep Center, is minus 1.36% in Georgia for, for all hospitals, and then 1.79% uh, is, the, is the profit margin on operations uh, for the entire United States. I would say that if you look at days cash on hand, um, it's, it's a lot less than, than what we see nationally, and so you see some of the metrics here uh, don't compare very favorably to the U.S. data. So with that, uh, the National Rural Health Association has promulgated uh, within Congress the Save Rural Hospitals Act. We think that it's important that we look at new provider types, a provider type, what we call the community outpatient hospital, that it's time that we look between the gap of a rural health clinic and a federally qualified health center and a critical access hospital, PPS hospital, and fill in the gaps of what community really needs in, in many of our rural and very frontier parts of this country. So with that, I'll stop and uh, turn it back over to my next colleague. I'm going to stand up because it's after lunch, and it, uh, it'll be easier for me. Uh, my name is Preston Smith, and I'm a graduate of the University of Georgia Law School, so I'm home. Uh, go dogs! And uh, after I graduated, I went into a law practice uh, that was uh, my part involved healthcare and hospital law uh, practice, and um, was just a few years into my practice when uh, I was asked after a Rotary Club meeting uh, if I would meet with three three guys who wanted to talk to me about a potential uh, venture that they wanted to interest me in. Um, one guy was from, um, from Roswell, one was from Warner Robins, and one from Savannah. Uh, it was Tom Price, Sonny Perdue, and Eric Johnson. And Eric Johnson uh, went on to be the president pro tem of the Georgia Senate. Uh, Sonny Perdue became, became governor and is nominated, I don't know if he's confirmed just yet, uh, to be the Secretary of Agriculture. And Tom Price has also got a busy job in front of him. Uh, and they asked me to run for the state Senate, and I did that and served for four terms. Um, and for five of those years was the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, and the most notable sort of work that I did in that committee was we did a comprehensive rewrite of the state's tort laws uh, in 2005. And uh, that bill came out under my um, authorship, but with the assistance of an awful lot of people and uh, a lot of work to get that through, uh, both the House and the Senate with a lot of folks um, looking at the balance of medical liability and tort law and sort of the intersection of law and health and business 
um, just a really fascinating process to go through uh, back in 2005. I went from there uh, to work for a company called Apollo MD. Um, Dr. Cannon's here from Apollo today. Uh, it's a group of physician services hospital based uh, that's now in about 150 different contracts in about 16 states, both rural and urban facilities around the country um, doing physician services, so on the provider side. Worked there for almost nine years, and this last year joined the Jackson Healthcare uh, family and work with a company called Tyler & Company, which is a retained executive search firm in the healthcare field. So we work with leaders placing executives into hospitals and healthcare systems. Um, so my background touches in these areas that we've been talking about today, and I'm really glad that um, Bill and, and the program does dive into particularly the policy. That's sort of my love, and I think it's really important. Um, you know, as we sit here today, there's a fire burning in the Okefenokee Swamp. Um, this morning it was only 3% contained, um, so it's a serious fire and they don't have it under control. Exactly one year ago, uh, I was in the swamp on a father-son trip that um, four of us took our boys uh, into a canoeing trip. We paddled 31 miles over three days through, right through the middle of the swamp with no guide. Um, it's an awful lot of fun. No Wi-Fi, nothing like that to go on. And uh, we got out there on the second day, and one of the 13-year-old boys um, who's packing up the canoe drops his dad's really expensive Nikon camera right into the, the black water of the swamp. It's tannic acid filled. You can't see through it. It's clean. It's just very dark. And so I said, and with great bravado, I'll get it. And so I jumped off the dock and into the water, and I'm wiggling around in there trying to find that camera and be the hero when one of the dads leans down and says, don't panic. <laughs> there are a few words in the English language that will incite more panic than the words don't panic. He says, but there is an alligator on the way over here. I think you might want to get out. And so <laughs> at the expense of my pride and with a significant amount of panic that had set in, um, I decided, did a quick RO, sort of a cost-benefit analysis, decided the camera was lost forever and could never be found and got out. Um, so I took note last year when in the last uh, part of the Obama administration, Andy Slavik, who was the acting administrator of CMS, came out with a statement that said, we've got some new rules and regulations that we're going to continue to implement. We don't want the providers to panic. And I thought to myself, well, I can't say what I thought to myself. Uh, <laughs> because they're recording this, but um, if you, if you want to see what happens, if you go home tonight and you're with your spouse and walk out to pick up the mail from the mailbox, get somewhere near something green and say, don't panic, but that might be a copperhead behind you, and you'll see what I mean by the feeling that overcomes you with the words, don't panic. Um, but I think that this is really, really important, what we're doing here today. And I think part of the importance of digging into the policy aspect is because the message is still not understood that we really are in and approaching a serious crisis with rural health care. I really do believe that, and I really do think that we can sometimes get caught up in the spreadsheets and the statistics and the policy weeds, and we can sometimes forget that while those things support an argument, what connects with people, what moves them on an emotional level, is when you can tell them a story that they will remember, and that really sits in. And so if you can share with people the real human face of those that are impacted by rural hospitals that are closing. And I know we've had some statistics. Some statistics. We've had five that have closed just since 2013, just in Georgia, uh, 80 nationwide over the last few years. It's a serious crisis, but those statistics will mean very little to people until you can show them a face to what's happening. And, and, and I'll just very briefly give you an example of that. We, in the process of going through the tort reform legislation, of course, there was lots of policy discussion, long hours of debate, lots of committee work, exchanges of bills back and forth, a lot of bipartisan work on that bill. And in the end, one of the things that made a difference was a young man who lived, went to school next door to a hospital in Monticello, Georgia called Jasper Memorial Hospital. And he came down to testify and he was playing football out on the football field outside the school on one afternoon when he was stung by a bee, he was allergic, he went into anaphylactic shock and dropped and stopped breathing, went into full respiratory arrest. They grabbed him and pulled him into the little ER of Jasper Memorial Hospital and saved his life, and he's perfectly fine. But Jasper Memorial Hospital had been in financial crisis and months before had faced the decision about whether or not to keep the doors open, and if so, how they could bridge that financial problem they were having. That young man stood up and told his story, and it was like the dots connected 
These aren't statistics. These aren't facts and figures only. These affect real lives because if that young man had had to wait on an EMS provider in rural Georgia to take him 45 minutes away to the next hospital, he would not be standing in front of us today. And so he stood there and just said, thank you. I want to tell my story and I want to thank you for what you, what you are doing to help provide access to rural health care in Georgia. It's the same concept that presidents use, every president in every state of the union now. It's the same reason why you won't be able to tell me a single statistic or fact that President Trump threw out in the State of the Union, but none of you will forget if you watch the speech when he asked the widow of the Special Forces officer to stand up, and that image of her and all of her cathartic emotion is seared into your memory. It's personal, it's real, it's emotional, and it connects with you. That's why politicians share stories like that, but it's also because it moves us and changes us to think about the real face behind these issues. So, you know, he could have stood there and talked about the number of military members that had died over the last year, and that would have been significant and should have moved us. But when he asked the wife of a lost fallen soldier to stand up, everyone in the country sort of took a breath and, and watched the real face of what that meant. So my encouragement to you is, as we talk about these issues, remember that the thing that they don't always teach you in law school, uh, you can learn the books, you can learn the cases, you can figure out what the law is and how to read the statutes and interpret the, the interaction of all the things that sometimes don't seem to weave together. What they sometimes don't teach you is that when you stand in front of a jury, or when you stand in the well of a Senate or a House chamber, or when you work with your colleagues or you talk at a meeting, what people will remember is when you connect with them on an emotional level. And this message about what is happening to our rural hospitals is a message that we have got to connect on an, on an elemental level in order to solve it. So, Bill, thank you for doing this, and I'm excited about the policy discussion. One of the occupational hazards of being a health economist is I'm often on panels where the speaker next to me or before me is eloquent and excited and tells you don't worry about statistics. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to show you some statistics, basically. <laughs> um, uh, the, the point of view I want to take or talk about today is a, is a broad view of insurance and insurance in Georgia and differences in rural and urban uh, and across rural uh, Georgia. I'm going to do this at a very high level, um, but we finance our health care through an insurance model, a public or private. And understanding an insurance model, how it's going to affect uh, different regions, different people, is important to understand what's going on and where we can go. So um, uh, Gary Nelson likes to talk about the two Georgias. And of course, he's right. Uh, rural Georgia and urban Georgia are very different in, in terms of uh, insurance coverage and how they finance that care. As you can see from these statistics, uh, rural Georgia is less likely to have private insurance. They're more likely to have public insurance, and they're more likely to be uninsured. But the truth is, uh, there are more than two Georgias. We discovered this uh, when we started doing surveys of, Georgia and their sources of uh, Georgians and their sources of health insurance in uh, 2000, we essentially came up with four Georgias. I'm going to demonstrate using this map. Um, uh, but there is obviously the, the large metropolitan area. There are smaller metropolitan areas. There is south uh, um, rural areas and north rural areas. And they have different characteristics in health and in the way they finance their health care. This is a map of Medicaid. Uh, uh, as a percentage of a county's population. Darker colors here mean a larger percentage of that county uh, uh, coverage comes through the Medicaid program. Um, and you can see uh, quite a bit of difference. The darker colors are over a third of the city, of the county's population receives their health care through the Medicaid program. Um, when you look at that picture, you can think of, of two things. Um, if you try to estimate what would happen if we expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, it would be those darker counties that would have the biggest expansion in coverage, the biggest influx of new dollars uh, of, of, of health care resources. You can also look at this in, and look at what happens if we change the way Medicaid is financed. Right now, uh, since its inception, Medicaid has been a matching program. That is, uh, the states put in a dollar, the federal government matches that. The match depends upon the state's per capita income relative to the nation. Right now, Georgia gets two federal dollars for every dollar uh, uh, Georgia taxpayers put in. In Mississippi, it's three dollars to one. In New York, it's one to one. All right? uh, one of the proposals for changing Medicaid uh, uh, funding is to go to a match, uh, to, I'm sorry, to go for, away from a match to go to a block grant, to fix the amount that the federal government provides to 
uh, the state. What that means is that when healthcare costs go up, or when we go into an economic downturn where more uh, individuals become eligible for Medicaid, uh, there are, there's no more dollars coming from the federal government the way there is now. Um, the, the state would have to find ways to finance that. The impact on rural Georgia would, would look like the impact on coverage right here. That is, when the, when the CBO looked at this and said there'd be about 16 million more uh, uninsured, they were talking about Medicaid, they were talking about rural areas, and that's where they'd show up in Georgia. Um, of course, the um, uh, Medicaid ex um, uh, coverage is based on income, and income's a good predictor of health. This map shows uh, the health status of Georgians, ranked. Lighter colors are healthier, darker colors are a lower rank. You can see a, a, a pretty good match to that Medicaid map. Um, that, is, that is, again, we see differences in rural Georgia on the health of the individuals. Uh, we see differences in their needs. We've heard that several times uh, today. Um, this also uh, describes the differences in the way private insurers would have to uh, um, charge premiums. Health insurance premiums are based on several factors, but the most important one is the likelihood that somebody is going to file a claim and the size of those claims. And that likelihood is dependent upon the health status of the people who enroll in the plan. So those darker counties are going to have higher health insurance premiums if they're rated by themselves because they have a sicker population. Now, when the Affordable Care Act was enacted, it changed the way health insurance was uh, uh, financed, the way the market, the health insurance market, was um, operated. And what it did was it said, um, you, you can't charge a different premium to a different individual based on health status. The only thing you can charge different premiums for is based on age and where they live. And in Georgia, the, the state was divided into 16 insurance regions. Um, this map has different colors. Those colors are just to uh, distinguish the regions, not for any other meaning. But if you look at this map, uh, it looks pretty jerry-rigged. It looks like a gerrymander, excuse me. A jerry-rigged's a good term, too. It's gerrymandered to describe um, uh, exactly what the uh, health status of in the population. The, the people in each of those regions can be, ch uh, same individual, can be charged very different premiums. Um, uh, and we, in fact, Georgia has the biggest disparity in premiums, or spread of premiums, in the state of any state in, in the union. Um, you can see the uh, three is the urban area. Three and two, Athens, where we are now, have the lowest premiums uh, in the state. Fifteen, uh, uh, southwest Georgia, has the highest premiums. Now, um, I know this is a hard, uh, uh, I have this up here so I can remember it. I don't expect anybody to be able to read this, especially from the back of the room. But what we're showing here are the premiums. Um, the 2017 premiums by those regions in the map I just described. And you can see that um, uh, region number one and region number 15 have the highest. Region number one has a, this is for a 40 year old uh, person in that region without a subsidy, they're paying $516 a month. Uh, that same 40 year old, if they moved to Metro Atlanta, would pay $286 a month uh, for, for health insurance. Um, but the Affordable Care Act didn't just divide up and, and say uh, the, the, region, the state into regions and uh, allow you to, to do different uh, premiums. Based on it, there have two kinds of subsidies in the Affordable Care Act. The first is the one we talk most about. It's the premium subsidy. It says um, what the Affordable Care Act did was it defined affordability. It said everybody, nobody should pay more than a percentage of their family income for health insurance. That percentage actually gets uh, smaller as income uh, falls. But if you're under 400% of poverty, um, your percentage of income determines how much you'll have to pay max. And the subsidies, the difference between that percentage and the actual premium. What that means is that a person in Albany and a person in Atlanta of the same income, same family income, if it's under 400% of poverty, are paying exactly the same premium out of pocket. And the subsidy is the difference. Um, uh, what you can see in the last column is that um, in Georgia, uh, in the Atlanta market, about 85% of the people who buy coverage in the exchange are getting a subsidy. In rural areas, it's about 92%. And, it, and, and, and of course, the difference is are those premiums that they have to pay that, that in fact, they qualify for a subsidy more often. Um, 
One of the proposals that we uh, came forward in Congress was to change that subsidy to a fixed amount based on age. It was going to be $4,000. It was actually for a 40 year old to be $3,000. You'd get to buy health insurance. That would not vary by region. The people who would be affected by that would be the uh, people in rural areas with the higher premiums. They would have to pay more. The second uh, premium in the, in the Affordable Care Act is for those people whose family incomes are below 250% of poverty, um, there is a subsidy for the cost sharing. We heard about uh, high deductible plans and, and other things. It said affordability means not only you can get insurance, but that you can pay for care once you have it. And so that subsidy pays for the deductibles and coinsurance rate for people whose family incomes are below 250% of poverty. As you can see in Georgia, uh, about 60% of the people who buy coverage get that subsidy. About uh, uh, over 70% in rural areas. Now, uh, when we think about public policy, both short term and long term, the short term is that uh, when that, uh, when law was enacted, this was part of the proposal, but Congress didn't fund it. So the uh, uh, Obama administration took money from another place and funded the subsidy with that money. The House objected, and they have a lawsuit saying that was unconstitutional. It's going before the Supreme Court. It's not yet been settled. But what's, what's also not settled is exactly how this administration is going to treat that subsidy. And the problem is, is that um, right now the, uh, the uh, insurance companies are trying to figure out whether they're going to be in the market and what their premiums will be for 2018. Until they have some uncertainty on what that subsidy is going to be or whether it exists, they uh, want to delay uh, issuing a premium and delay the decision of whether or not they're going to offer coverage to that half a million uh, people in, in Georgia. Um, so uh, that's just a broad introduction to the, to, the, to the health insurance issues. This is something we're going to be discussing for a long time, but the, the main message I wanted to give was that these issues strike hardest in rural areas. They strike harder they, in different ways in north and south rural areas. So thank you. Thank you. This one works. This one works. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you, Bill, for having me here today. I'm Ethan James with the Georgia Hospital Association. Uh, GHA represents more than 170 hospitals throughout the state of Georgia, from our small rural critical access hospitals that I know we're certainly here to discuss today, all the way through our lar large urban multi-hospital health systems. Uh, we, of course, represent uh, the specialty hospitals like Children's Health Care of Atlanta. We represent the rehab hospitals, uh, the long-term acute care hospitals. Uh, and a number of uh, freestanding psychiatric hospitals. Uh, but while we sit here and talk about, and my esteemed colleagues have done such a good job of painting a p picture of this crisis that we're having, we like to focus on perhaps the last five or six years and those uh, five, six, seven hospitals that have closed throughout the state of Georgia. I'm here to tell you it's, it's much worse than that. And I can't say that this is a new phenomenon, these hospital closures. I can't say that this is even a trend anymore. It's the reality. And I'd like to take us back decades into the 1980s, and I wrote this down because these are important numbers. During the decade of the 1980s, seven hospitals closed in Georgia, and that was six of those being rural. In the 1990s, 21 hospitals closed in Georgia, seven of those being rural, nine of them being psychiatric hospitals. And what does that do as these hospitals close throughout Georgia? The ones that don't close, the ones that are surviving, absorb all those patients. And these are the patients that the reason these hospitals are closed, these are uninsured patients. These are patients without true access to coverage. And if these hospitals can't afford to stay open anymore, they're closing down. Well, those patients don't stay in those communities. Those patients just don't go away. They go out to the other hospitals, further burdening the surviving hospitals, further burdening the, the healthcare system in Georgia. Take you to this century, in the 2000s, 11 hospitals closed in that first decade of this century five of those being rural, and three more being psychiatric hospitals, once more exacerbating the, the situation. And then into this decade, and we're only two-thirds of the way through this decade, I'll remind you, we've already had 13 hospitals close. It's not the five or six that we like to focus on since 2012. It's 13 hospitals, six of them rural, two more uh, psychiatric hospitals, those are the big state psychiatric facilities, hundreds and hundreds of beds gone from the system and the community hospitals are there to absorb it and these psychiatric patients mental health patients are showing up in the emergency rooms 
further burdening the system. Of those 13, two of those were rural hospitals that had to close and merge into a single hospital. That hospital didn't stay open more than a couple of years before it was financially burdened and is still seeking a financial partner to stay open. Two more of them closed and reopened with limited service, uh, limited services for their community. One of those being labor and delivery. And you think about this, when a labor and delivery closes for a hospital, so on, when a labor and delivery unit close, closes for a community, what are those new families doing? Those families are getting married, they're starting to, to grow. Where are they going? They're going to the hospital down the street if they can't have their baby in their, their local hospital. They're going 30 miles away, 45 miles away, 60 miles away. Suddenly that becomes their hospital. And they're not staying in their local community hospital. And that could be the beginning of the end when you have to close labor and delivery. And all of a sudden the, the families of that community start going somewhere else. Two more of those hospitals that I mentioned of the 13 that closed this decade have only closed their emergency room because it's the most expensive form of care. There's nowhere more expensive to get care than in the emergency room because you wait without insurance again. These are patients without insurance. You wait until you're so ill or so injured that you know, the only place you can go without insurance is to go to the emergency room. But these hospitals cannot afford to keep their emergency rooms op open any longer, so they're closing those just to be able to survive and keep something available for their communities. And that's why we say, as again, all these other hospitals have closed, the patients are still there, that we say that another dozen hospitals in Georgia are on the brink of closure. And I wouldn't be surprised if we found out even more within the next month or two are closing. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the rest of the panel and we'll continue this very important discussion. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth, you mentioned a couple of things. 258, SB 258. Have you all talked about that already today? No. It's the Rural Hospital Tax Credit, and this was introduced by uh, uh, Representative Jeff Duncan last year. Great idea, uh, championed by, of course, uh, Senator Dean Burke, who's still with us here in the front row, and we appreciate all of his work on this. This is an important initiative to give uh, hospitals the ability to approach their community, both businesses and individuals, and solicit contributions to their hospital to help, help uh, stabilize their finances. And for that, you get a tax credit, and the legislature set it last year at 70%. Not a tax deduction, depending upon your income level, you know, how much you can deduct from your, your tax burden, but an actual tax credit. And it was based upon a uh, tax credit program established for uh, private schools in Georgia. Now that one was established at 100%, dollar for dollar tax credit. The rural hospital tax credit was established at 70%. So if you give a contribution, you get to take a tax credit off of your, your, uh, your state taxes of 70% of that contribution. We found and it was set at a, a maximum of $50 million for the first year. We found through the first couple of months of the year that that was not being really taken advantage of. There were so many other tax credit programs out there that were already set at 100% that both businesses and individuals were saying to their local hospitals upon solicitation, why would I, why would I do a 70% tax credit when I could take advantage of a 100% tax credit and sometimes even buy those transferable tax credits uh, at pennies on the dollar late in the year. So the legislature, in its wisdom, and thank you again to Dr. Burke for what he did this year, uh, passed SB um, 180 that raised that from 70% to 90%. Now, because you're donating to a not-for-profit, a 90% tax credit on your state tax burden, and then again, depending upon your income level, you can take a tax deduction on your federal tax burden, and you actually probably would come out ahead. So this should be, and uh, also was raised from $50 million to $60 million this year. And that should be a, a great benefit to so many of these hospitals. I think last year there were 49 eligible, and you've now raised it to 55-ish hospitals that will be available, uh, eligible for that tax credit. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, CON, I know that's come up a couple of times uh, this morning. Um, and I'm never sure about the audience I'm speaking to as far as their knowledge about CON. Everybody know what CON is? A few? Anybody understand the importance of it? Certificate of need? Well, to boil it down, because healthcare is very complex, uh, if I could, I'll tell you uh, just a quick story about the importance of CON. Um, I have a friend who is uh, a rural um, businessman. His real business is uh, owning the local Ford dealership. But he got very involved in uh, healthcare years ago and wound up joining his local hospital authority board. 
And in speaking to him, he said, you know what, I finally understood uh, what CON is and how to really explain it very, very easily. And he said, CON is just like my ownership of my Ford dealership. He said, I have an agreement with Ford Motor Company that I get to sell the Ford vehicles for this particular region. They don't let anybody else come in here and sell Ford vehicles in this region. But the only thing I make money on is selling the Ford F-150 pickup truck. It's the only thing I can actually make money on. But because my agreement with Ford Motor Company is to be that dealership, I've got to sell the minivan, I've got to sell the, the sedan, I've got to sell the, the little subcompact, all of which in rural Georgia don't sell. He wasn't laughing. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's just the F-150 is the only thing that sells and the only thing they can really make money on. He also ha has to handle the trade-ins. He has to handle the financing. He has to handle the service department, which he says, contrary to popular belief, he doesn't make any money on the service line. He said all of these expenses, the things he doesn't make money on that he has to do for his community, he gets to have the Ford F-150 as the sales. He said, now, if Ford Motor Company came along and allowed somebody to open up an F-150 dealership right across the street, he said, I'd be out of business in a month. If all they got to do was sell the F-150 and make all the profits and leave me with everything else, that's what CON is. That's what it protects. It protects the few service lines that hospitals can make money on in order to do all the things that the community needs that they can't make money on. Trauma care, emergency room care, intensive care, all the things that they lose money on. That's what CON protects. Well, there's uh, two separate topics. The, the financing is, is the, the matching grant that we just now. The, um, um, my grant, of course, changes that in some way. The waiver programs, though, uh, have always existed, and Georgia's taken advantage of to cover different populations, to cover different services. Um, uh, there, there are currently uh, new <laughs> types of waiver settings that go beyond just the Medicaid program. In fact, some of the discussion about expanding uh, Medicaid um, in the state has been about taking advantage of the 1332 waiver, which is a waiver developed by the Affordable Care Act, that allows uh, a state to take a wide variety of uh, federal money, including the subsidies that go for the exchanges and the Medicaid subsidies, and create a, a state uh, specific program that covers similar types of people in ways the state would like to do that. So um, uh, the state could, for example, change the Medicaid program to allow uh, it to pay premiums for private insurance through the exchange. It could uh, create uh, health savings accounts for the Medicaid folks and put money there and allow them to manage that money in ways that they see fit and change the way um, the, the way services are paid for. And I, I can go on, there's a, a couple of, of, of proposals like that that could lie on a lot of different things that allow the state to pull down that uh, money that are, they're not taking down now for the Medicaid expansion, but tailor uh, both that program and the exchange program to things that the state's comfortable with, whether it works the most. And one of the ways you can think about that for uh, purposes of this is that you can do different things in rural areas than you do in urban areas. The, the key to that waiver program is that you're going to cover uh, about the same number of people. And I, I should say one more thing about that. Um, we hear a lot about high-risk pools as a way to do this, but Alaska did something different where they created a reinsurance program. And they essentially, what was going to happen was their Blue Cross plan was the only insurer there. They were saying, we're going to have to raise our rates in the exchanges uh, a lot to make this cover because we need so many of the sicker folks in here. And the state legislature in Alaska said, well, we'll pay you um, a significant amount of money if, if you keep rates low. And they did that, and then the state said to the federal government, well, we're actually saving you money because by keeping the premiums low, the subsidies you're paying are less. So you should help us fund that reinsurance program that is covering these high risks. And uh, the federal government agreed with that, and the uh, secretary uh, Price said, this is uh, something states should look into. 
And, it, and, and what that does, of course, is it stabilizes the, the private market in, uh, in areas where the premiums would be much higher if you have that. And it actually levels the premiums across different parts of the state. So there's lots of ideas out here. It's just that the waivers are available to, to design your program. The, the, the mechanism is there. We just have to decide as a state how we want to do it. So, so since I have bringing up your expert on Medicaid and protein, I have a really sort of big question about it. I don't quite understand when people say block grant applied to Medicaid. You know, Medicaid is insurance and it also is long term care. What would a block grant do to those two big pots in Medicaid? Well, that's the, there's two different issues there. So, uh, about 40% of Medicaid dollars, uh, actually, maybe more now, go to long term care services, not traditional health care services. That's just part of the expansion. Again, the Medicaid program was designed in 1965 um, to help to level the field across states in, the, in their health care systems. So, it was designed to be a matching grant. The matching grant was intended to encourage states to put in their own money. But it, because states had different resource bases, the match from the federal government depended upon state and, uh, for, for the average per capita income. That way, in lower income states got uh, more federal drawdown. And again, they can do programs that they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford. If Rock Grant says we're going to give each state, uh, and there's a lot of work that's going to determine how much, we're going to give them a very <coughs> period. And the quid pro quo is that the states would have a lot more flexibility to design a Medicaid program. They can do a lot more in terms of eligibility, in terms of service coverage, in terms of reimbursement than they could do now, but they would only they would always get a fixed amount. Um, the proposal that was in uh, front of the House actually adopts a different strategy for a black grant. It's a per person black grant. So part of the problem with black grant is that we go into economic downturn, more people are eligible for Medicaid, and the state would have to come up with all the funds for that. Um, so they did a per person black grant, which said the per person costs are fixed. But if you get more people, then you uh, can draw down money from the federal government. The problem for a state like Georgia is that it means that every dollar of health care cost increase uh, is now borne by state taxpayers, or they're going to have to change um, the system. And when the CBO looked at this and tried to estimate the impact, they assumed the states would take no, would take, not put up more money. They assumed that the states would find ways to reduce costs, and the easiest way to do that is to do something good. So, so, so they would co-mingle the insurance side and the long-term care side. Absolutely, it's all one program for the for the match grant. Which, which, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's a real food, food fight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Between, between the hospitals, the doctors, and the nursing homes. So, 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 not only is it a per capita, element very important, but the second those three elements, the physician, hospital, and uh, all the care services, is crucial. I think that's all the time we have for questions, so thank you, panel, for your time.